Welcome to Beyond the Radio Dial, a wireless innovation forum podcast about the importance of radio spectrum for everyday life. I'm Stephanie Hamill, Marketing Director for the Forum. Beyond the Radio Dial is hosted by Andy Clegg, Wind Forum's Chief Technology Officer and self-described spectrum nerd. Now, here's Andy. All right. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, Hi, all. Welcome uh, to this episode of Beyond the Radio Dial, where we take a closer look at how the radio spectrum impacts our everyday lives. Today, we're pinging Frank Sanders from the U.S. government's Institute for Telecommunication Sciences. Uh, Frank is a world-renowned expert in radar systems, and that is the topic of this edition of Beyond the Radio Dial. So, Frank, first, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Andy. It's an honor to do this. Great. So, I think um, most of our listeners are, you know, familiar with with the word radar, and they're, they're, you know, familiar with the use of weather radar and things like that uh, in, in their everyday lives. But um, can, can you start us out with the fundamentals? Uh, what is radar? How does it work? Uh, some of those considerations? Absolutely, Andy. Radar is a technology that uses radio waves to detect objects in space around us and tell us where the objects are in direct and in distance. Fundamentally, that's what radio detection and ranging radar is. So uh, was there a moment in history where someone discovered the concept of radar or was, you know, from the, from the moment radio was first harnessed and used, was there the theory behind it and people just needed to develop the technology to use it? Or did somebody accidentally uh, in, invent radar? How, how did it come to be? Yeah, uh, it turns out that radar was developed as a result of a historical contingency for defense. Specifically, after the First World War, the island of Britain discovered that it was not an island. The U.S. uh, Army conducted experiments where they sank battleships that were anchored with aircraft. And there was a man named Douay who came out with a theory of strategic bombing that said that civilian populations could be defeated in war with aerial attack. And all of this occurred in the 1920s and into the early 1930s. And the British became concerned that the British Navy would no longer be able to single-handedly defend the island of Britain. With the rise of Nazi Germany in the 1930s, a method for detecting aircraft at long distances in order to conduct coordinated air defense with other aircraft became absolutely imperative. The British and other countries looked at using acoustic systems for hearing aircraft at long distances. They were giant microphones with with giant horns. And it was an interesting idea, but it was not practical and it did not work. However, Ever since the 1920s, people had observed that when ships moving in harbors and channels sailed between transmitters and receivers, the presence of the ships would cause distortion and other effects in the radio waves that the receivers were getting from the transmitters. This gave people the idea that they might be able to detect aircraft at long range with some kind of transmitted radio signals. In Britain, some technical experts were consulted, and they were initially asked if they could develop a death ray. (laughs) And the experts said, oh, no, uh, no, not not really. But but they said we might be able to transmit high power radio signals that we could bounce off of aircraft at long ranges and then receive those bounced signals, echoes back with receivers and by timing the out and back period for the transmitted signals, we could get the distance. And by using antenna patterns, we could get dis- we could get directions. And we think that this might be a technology that might work. And so, in the 1934-1935 timeframe, 
The British conducted an experiment where they used high power broadcast signals that were coming off of BBC transmitters for, for conventional radio broadcast to bounce signals off of aircraft and receive the echoes. And they proved that the principle could work. Hmm. Having proved that the principle of detecting aircraft at long distances could work, they sat down with a concerted, well-funded technical effort to develop this radio detection and ranging technology and turn it into something that could be used to detect aircraft approaching Britain. Hmm. Within a very short period of time, just a few years, they had developed a radar type called Chain Home that operated down at low frequencies, down around five or 10 megahertz. And they built a network of these chain home radar stations around the eastern coasts of Britain. And they used those radars to watch air traffic over Europe. And they practiced with the Royal Air Force with interceptions of commercial airliners that were crossing the channel. And they developed an integrated air defense system in which radars would detect aircraft even as they were lifting off from airfields in France. Hmm. And RAF planes could be held on the ground until the very last minute because they had very little gasoline available. And then they would be vectored with telephone calls to airfields and with ground to air communications on, on audio links to intercept incoming aircraft. That turned out to be the key to the defense of Britain from June of 1940 when Paris fell until the United States came into the war in December of 1941. Uh, the last thing I'll say is we cannot overstate the importance of radar because without radar, the British could not have maintained the standing air patrols to prevent the German Air Force from overwhelming the British Air Force. And if that had happened and the Germans had landed in Britain, it would have been just about game over for democracy. So radar was the key to allowing the British to have an integrated air defense that held off the German Air Force until December of 41 when the U.S. came into the war. And uh, the rest, is, as we would say, is history. So I, I take it the Germans were a little bit behind in developing radar at that point. So the the British got out ahead of them in the radar technology back, back during the war. There, there were four countries that were working on radar development in the 1930s, and they were Britain, which had a very vested interest in developing something that would work on a short time scale, and they did. Scientists and engineers in Germany and the United States and Japan also were working on radar concepts. But only in Britain did they make the uh, technical breakthrough that allowed the radars to really be developed. And, and one other sort of historical footnote that, that's worth noting. Although the chain home radars operated with giant transmitter tubes uh, that were based on BBC HF transmitters, the British also made a crucial technical advance by developing a thing called a magnetron. A magnetron is a little tube about this big. It fits in the palm of your hand. There's one in every microwave oven, and the magnetrons were oscillators that took line power in, you know, out of a wall outlet or out of a generator on, a generator on an aircraft or a ship or whatever, and turned that into radio power up at frequencies of, of 1,000 megahertz to 10,000 megahertz, 1 to 10 gigahertz, at power levels of a million watts, a megawatt. And the development of the magnetron meant that radars could be installed in ships, they could be installed in aircraft, they could be installed on ground stations, they could be used to search for aircraft, they could be used to search for targets defensively and offensively, they were even installed on submarines. But the British, although they knew how to build a magnetron, and at the time it, it was very secret, that magnetron in your, mic in your microwave oven at the time was a big, big, big secret. In 1940, when they made the breakthrough, they had no manufacturing capacity. So a man named Tizard, who chaired a scientific technical committee in Britain, sent the magnetron that they built along with some engineers and some other British inventions on an ocean liner across the Atlantic to the United States. Hmm. Remember, the US was not in the war yet. Roosevelt was definitely on the side of the British, but America was not in the war yet. 
But this tizzard scientific commission unveiled the magnetron to their American colleagues. And the Americans, when they saw it, basically said, that's what we've been trying to do. You wow. did it. You figured it out. Wow. And here was the key. America truly was the arsenal of democracy. America could manufacture magnetrons and the radars to go with them by the thousands and the tens of thousands. And that production of magnetron radars throughout World War II was one of the key elements in the success of the Allied victory um, in the Second World War. So a direct connection from the protection of the Allied forces in World War II to uh, microwave popcorn today, which That's most true. people probably don't think about. Interesting, it's fascinating. True. Um, so, you know, give us an idea. We're, we're, you know, we're talking about detecting uh, planes flying over the uh, the Channel and things like that, heading for uh, Great Britain. Uh, you know, most people, uh, you know, whether they know or not, but radio waves travel at effectively the speed of light. Um, and, you know, a lot of people have the, sort of the concept that the speed of light is essentially infinite or whatever, but but it's not. Radar depends on the fact that, that the speed of light is not infinite. So what kind of timescales are we talking here? So here's here's one way of thinking about the speed of light. Radar and all other radio waves, including visible light coming out of a light bulb, consists of waves that are moving at the rate of one foot, that's the width of a floor tile in a linoleum floor, one foot in one billionth of a second, one foot in one nanosecond. So if you have a room that is, mm, say, 20 feet across, and you have a light on one end of the room, and you hit the light switch, and the light comes on, it takes 20 billionths of a second for the light from the light bulb to go the width of the room or the length of the room. And you might think, wow, that's really, really fast. It's yeah. 186,262 miles in a single second, 186,000 miles in a second, 300,000 kilometers in a second. And again, you'd be thinking, wow, super duper fast. But no, not that fast. When the Apollo moon landings were being planned, they talked about doing the landings with radio control from the Earth. And it turns out that the time it takes for a radio wave to get from the Earth to the moon and back for a round trip is on the order of about three seconds or so, two and a half, three, four seconds. That's way too much time delay to conduct a... Uh, human landing on the moon. So they realized that they had to go autonomous with that because the speed of light is that slow. And another indication of how slow the speed of light is, it takes eight minutes for light to get from the sun to the earth. We always see the sun eight minutes behind where it actually is. And when we're talking to a probe or a lander at Mars, depending upon where Mars is relative to the earth, you're looking at a uh, 20 to 40 minute trip to get from the Earth to Mars with a radio signal and another 20 to 40 minutes to get back. That means that depending upon where Mars is, you can send a message to somebody or a thing at Mars and say, how are you doing? And then you can go get up, use the restroom, get a cup of coffee, uh, check out the donut buffet, come back and sit down at your console before you will get the reply that says, we're doing pretty good, thanks. <laughs> so that's how slow, that's how yeah. slow the speed of light is. And yet, you know, radars depend very critically on the, the concept of, of, that light is, in fact, relatively slow, cosmically speaking. And that's how it determines distance by the round trip travel time for the radio wave. Um, very good. So you, you've touched on the use of radars in the military, which is, you know, essentially where it, where it developed, where it came from. Um, and it's still used today, obviously. But, you know, behind you, you have uh, some examples of many different types of radar. So, you know, there's common use of radar in a lot of different industries and applications. Can you tell us about some of the more common uses of radar besides the military? Absolutely. Um, one type of radar that people see and make use of every day, sometimes almost every minute of every day, is weather radar. Weather radar transmit signals that are reflected by precipitation, not by clouds, but by precipitation, water droplets, rain, hail, 
snow, that kind of thing. Sometimes even a really heavy uh, fog. They also reflect flocks of birds and swarms of insects and so forth. Weather radars are, are just absolutely integral to safety of life for warnings of of the imminent uh, development and onset of tornadoes. They're used for tracking hurricanes. They're used for tracking every other weather system you can name. There are any number of apps that people can download on their phones. Pretty much everybody knows about weather radars. And uh, those those are hugely important. Another use of radar, which uh, you see in, in the corner up here behind me is the bar, that spinning bar. Those are maritime navigation surface search radars. They're used by vessels at sea to prevent running into each other and also to prevent running into things like rocks. Uh, the uh, orange uh, painted radar antenna that's down in the lower corner is an airport surveillance radar. Those are used to track aircraft that are approaching and departing from airports. There's also a thing called a radar beacon, which is that fence-like looking antenna on top. That's a separate topic, but it's a sort of a radar. It's two radars built into one. Um, the, the radar that you're going to see here when I move my head, that is a giant space search, space tracking radar. Um, it is in a, a building that is, I think, 10 or 12 stories tall, as I recall. Uh, it operates around 400 megahertz. It's used to track objects in space, things as small as tennis balls and baseballs and things as large as the International Space Station to literally keep track of what's in space orbiting the Earth. We also have long range radars that are in things like the big white bubble in, in the other corner behind me. And then we have uh, tactical air search radars. That's the big uh, flat plate that you see. But radars are used even for more things than, than what I'm mentioning here. Uh, there are things called wind profiler radars. These are giant arrays or horns that point straight up. And they're used at launch facilities like Cape Canaveral to tell us what the winds aloft look like before a rocket launch. In fact, if the winds aloft are too strong, as indicated by the radar, the, the launch will actually be delayed. Um, what else do we have? We also have um, what are called HF, high frequency radars. Now we're back to what the chain home was. These are used to look for objects that are skimming just above the ocean surface um, in, in coastal areas um, for uh, defense and alert. We also have, let's see, at, oh, at airports, another radar that you'll see on top of a control tower, it'll be a spinning bubble or a spinning bar, and it'll be on top of the control tower. That radar is being used to track vehicles and aircraft as they move on the ground. That's called an airport surface detection rate, <clears throat> excuse me, radar. Um, and then we have ground penetrating radars that are used to see things that are, that are below the ground surface, uh, like like, for example, if police are, are searching for a body. Um, and, and really, the list just goes, goes on and on. Oh, and one last one I will mention that came up uh, over the last couple of years, radar altimeters. Aircraft use uh, various methods to estimate their height above sea level. And for example, GPS can see height above sea level. A barometric altimeter that uses air pressure can, can use height above sea level. But Pilots and airplanes aren't really all that interested in how high they are above sea level. What they really, really, really want to know is how high are they above the ground? Because yeah. the ground hurts when you hit it. <laughs> and so radar altimeters are little radars in the bellies of aircraft that actually look straight down. And they tell the pilots the exact actual distance that they actually are above the hard ground that would hurt them if they ran into it. So, yeah. so airborne radar altimeters and there are more, but I'll stop there. Yeah, no, I mean, there's applications uh, everywhere. And I, you know, I was thinking while you were talking, the, the picture there in the, in the lower right of the uh, airport uh, radar uh, reminds me, you know, gives you a good idea of how they work because, you know, most people have seen these at, at, at airports and they're, they rotate around every few seconds. And so the idea is the round trip, travel time of the radio wave out to the object and back tells you how far it is away. And then the rotation tells you what direction it is. Um, and so the combination of these factors can help determine where the object is that you're, that you're seeing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 
Good. Interesting. Um, so, you know, it leads us, we have to ask this question of everybody uh, because we're a spectrum focused podcast. Uh, what are some of the spectrum challenges that are faced by, by radars today and, and looking forward? Great uh, question, Andy. So radars operate at tremendously high transmit power levels. They transmit typically on the order of a billion, with a B, watts of power out into space. A billion watts. It's called a gigawatt. So they'll transmit a gigawatt of power out. But that power dissipates as it travels outward away from the radar. And then only a very small fraction of that power is intercepted by an object out in space, like an airplane or a boat or whatever. And that very small fraction of dissipated power that is intercepted by the object is not even all reflected back toward the radar transmitter. And then as that small fraction that does remain is reflected back as an echo called a pulse echo, it dissipates even more as it makes the return trip home. So the result is that although we transmit a gigawatt of power out from an object, we might only be seeing a billionth, a billionth of a watt coming back into the receiver. Hmm. And you'd say, wow, that's hard to detect. And I would say, that's right, that's hard to detect. Yeah. And and a lot of the a lot of the trick to what people do with radar design is to figure out how to make the most of that of that billionth of a watt that's actually coming coming back in to coming back into the radar uh, receiver. And so the spectrum challenges for radars are to try to coexist with other systems in the radio spectrum that may either be on the radar frequencies or may be on frequencies close to a radar. And the challenge goes both in the direction of those other radio systems needing to live with the high transmitted radar power levels going out and the radars needing to live with the fact that they need quiet conditions. They need quiet radio spectrum to hear those very, very, very faint pulse echoes that are coming back from the targets amidst all kinds of other radio noise. So that's 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 the biggest single challenge for radars. Where where is the radar technology heading? Are there developments that are going to make it easier for radar to coexist with other systems, or are there uh, you know technology being developed to make them even more accurate? Where, where is radar technology heading? Radar technology certainly is developing in the direction of being designed with newer systems to cope with a noisier radar environment called electronic countermeasures, ECM, okay, um, being able to better hear those very faint echoes through a lot of noise. So there's that. And another area that I think for radar design that's really interesting is to be able to know more about an object than just where it is in space. We know a couple things from biology. We know that bats are able to do echolocation with acoustic waves, waves with their, with their uh, voices and their ears, and they can distinguish between different things that are echoing back at them. We also know that beluga whales, which also use acoustic pulsing, it's like radar, but it's acoustic, can tell the difference between a penny and a dime dropped into an Olympic-sized swimming pool that's I think a hundred meters long. The beluga can tell the difference. And we too are able to do some processing, not as much as a beluga whale seems to be able to do to mm -hmm. not just see where an object is in space, but see details of the object itself. Things like how it is shaped and things like to some extent, what's inside the object. I've seen pictures where you can get hints of what's inside an airframe of something that's up in the sky, for example. And we have a lot more that we can do with that. In other words, there's a lot of information in those faint pulse echoes that conventional radars do not take advantage of, but wow. that can be processed to show the shapes and the internal details of objects if only we could be as smart as a beluga whale and know how to do more readout 
on the information that's contained in those pulse echoes. I think ITS needs to consider hiring beluga whales to help them develop algorithms for, for radar detection. Um, well, very, very good, Frank. This, yeah, this is absolutely fascinating. I, you know, I, I know you've been involved in the development of radar, uh, radar technology and radar testing for a long time. We've interacted in various professional capacities on radar. Uh, you know, fascinating topic. Uh, it's great to, to have you available to us. Uh, we also encourage, we'll put a link in the, um, in the, in the, in, in the, uh, down below, but uh, there's a profile of, of Frank on the uh, uh, ITS website. And Frank is involved in a lot of other very fascinating endeavors, including paleontology and uh, astrophotography in his spare time. So, so Frank is a fascinating guy, uh, probably a good guy to sit around uh, and have a beer with sometimes. So uh, thank you for joining us, Frank. Uh, we hope uh, that you have many happy returns in the radar field, I'll say. Um, and thanks for joining <laughs> us today and, and uh, appreciate your time. Thank you, Andy. It's been a pleasure. Great. Thanks, Frank.